Hey everyone, I'm Lee Jin along with Nathan Vachez. Hello. And this is Means of Creation, a show where we deep dive into the passion economy and the future of work. The show is made by Every, a writer's collective focused on business. And this is a really fascinating episode. I think it's one of my favorites because we had a very interesting conversation with Gustav Soderstrom, who is the chief R&D officer at Spotify. And the chief product officer. Yes. He has a really broad purview at the company um, and oversees teams across product, design, data, technology, and engineering, and reports directly to Daniel Ek. Um, What's really interesting about Gustav also is that he's been at the company since it was just 30 people in Stockholm. So he's had this very long-term view of the evolution of the business and in including what's coming down the line in the future. Yeah, it was fascinating because like you don't often, you know, I've been reading about and thinking about Spotify for a while and using it, you know, just as a fan and as a user for even longer. And it's so cool to see like, oh, the people who build these like, you know, giant companies, like they think similar thoughts as we do. Those are the, the mm-hmm. sorts of frameworks that animate their decisions are the frameworks that that animate our decisions. And, and of course, they're at a totally different level of scale and complexity and all that. But um. I just loved how like relatable it all was, you know? Yeah, it was really interesting to get the inside glimpse. And I've always felt like Spotify was one of those hidden like powerhouses in the creator economy that no one really thinks of as a creator company, but all of the content on the platform comes from creators. And yeah. Daniel Ek has said on the record many times that one of the goals of Spotify is to help bunch of creators make a living to basically power the creator middle class. So it was really interesting to talk about that as well as um, this really interesting initiative that they're pioneering around the open access platform. Totally. And they get into stuff like NFTs and things that you just wouldn't expect to hear Spotify be thinking about, but they are. So um, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Gustav, thanks so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So I wanted to kick off our conversation by talking about the concept of the creator middle class. This is something that I've written about in the past, um, about how the creator economy needs a middle class and one doesn't really exist today. And I know it's a mission that's also very near and dear to Spotify's um, ethos. And Daniel Ek has talked about how how Spotify wants to unlock the potential of human creativity by giving a million creative artists the opportunity to live off their art, Um, which is quite different from the state of the world today, especially in music. Um, I think there's been reports that only the very, very top tier of music artists are able to actually live off their streaming revenue. So how do we change that? I'm curious how Spotify is thinking about actually empowering the creator middle class and making it possible for a million artists to make a living. Yeah, so I think this goal is is really interesting. It was set by Daniel, who I, I think Spotify for a long time was seen as a as a, a tech company that kind of chose music because it looked easy. But that's that's as far as away from the truth as you could get. I think it doesn't really look every easy. venture capitalist <laughs> told you. To stay out of it, right? If you want to do a tech company, don't do music. It's so hard. The reason Daniel started in music is because he, he w- was uh, both like a technologist but a musician himself, worked with a bunch of Swedish musicians and even helped write a little bit of music. So I think he's always, always had that passion for the creator side. But Spotify very much focused on the consumer side for the, for the first sort of 10 years. And there was a real consumer problem to solve. I think, the, I think that the flat access model to music versus paying per item just unlocked a bunch of, of uh, use cases for consumers. You could soundtrack your sleep, you could go for a run, you didn't pay this marginal cost per minute anymore. And it opened up a different world to have access to all the music ever made. But um, about like eight to nine years in, Daniel kind of said, I think the next 10 years should be about the creator. Hmm. And so we actually changed from having the traditional MAU goals first, the sort of consumer-focused goals, to having creator goals first. And and one of the goals we set was this goal of having a million uh, artists, uh, music or talk audio or what have you, be able to live off of their art. And the definition there to set the bar high was to be able to live off of their art, which which means that there has to be many, many more than a million creators doing art, uh, we think the vast majority probably won't live off of it, but we wanted to try to set the bar high. 
Uh, and so we, we, we actually looked at what, what does it mean to be able to live off of something in, in different uh, parts of the world and so forth. So we try to be quite concrete about it. And, and as you pointed out, we're, we're a long way away from a million people being able to live off of their art, but that is our goal. That's kind of how we try to measure our success. And so this means that if you set that goal, you're going to start to do different things. You're going to look at what more can you do for a creator than, than just you know streaming royalties, for example. And so you kind of see this now in the moves that we're making where we are starting to allow, for example, talk audio creators to have paid podcasts in addition to just um, uh, free podcasts and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to take this, we're trying to enable many business models for creators. Uh, we're, we've done most so far actually in the talk audio space, partially because it's easier, because it isn't as, as uh, you don't have to license every single feature you want right. to develop. You right. can try more things. But our aim is to, increase options and increase ways to monetize for all kinds of creators and not just be a one size fits all um, platform for creators. So you can you can see us working and trying and finding new models whether they're you can you know we're a freemium company. We found a lot of success in the combination of free to get reach and then premium to monetize. Why shouldn't that be true for any creator? Why couldn't any creator be a freemium creator? Why couldn't they right. use free and premium for example? And we've learned so much about it. So why couldn't we offer that? And so today, even today on Spotify, you could kind of cobble this together. If you think about it, you could go and buy ads on Spotify in the free tier. Uh, and then you could buy customers for your own paid podcast on Spotify, right? So it's possible, but it's not, it's not well packaged. But this is how we think about it. Like we've learned so much about this business model. And the, the trend that we see is that creators take more and more control over their own fate. So they are going to want more and more of these services. So we want to turn this into a service for them. And it's going to take a while. And as you point out, we're early on the journey, but you can see what we're trying to do. I think that building out new business models and new ways for creators to monetize is definitely a huge element of building the creator middle class and enabling more more people across the spectrum, regardless of audience size, to be able to earn income. I think, well, at least my perception from Spotify's various product announcements has been that a lot of those product offerings are focused on podcasters and audio creators outside of music. Um, how do we bring that into music? And like, what are the considerations when applying or offering new business models to, to music artists? We have deliberately started with the talk audio creators and podcast creators. Uh, as I said, partially because it is easier to explore and move fast there. Uh, but we want to take these things to music creators as well. This is part of the reason why talk audio and music is actually part of the same platform. Mm -hmm. We think from a consumer point of view, they make sense together and, and kind of always had makes, have made sense together. But I think it's it's very probable that it actually makes sense together for creators as well. So one thing we see is that more and more creators, they become sort of multi-format. They're multi-talented. So you have people who do talk audio, who do music, who do video. They're, they're kind of multi-format. Right. right. So we, we started there, but we're thinking of, we're thinking of these as, as a, a general class of creators. And we're building this platform that we want to be able to use for all kinds of creators. But it is slower moving in the... Uh, music space because it's so different. It is a royalty-based model um, that is very large, largely controlled by labels. You need to negotiate changes in business models, often mm -hmm. as low as common denominator between very big players. So it is harder to explore. Um, and because it's such a big business, it's, all, it's also complicated and we need to be careful. Right. So we are, we are uh, building the... Uh, we are building and testing testing business models for for creators in general. We've started and moved fast in in audio, in talk audio, but we're we're planning to bring these kinds of things. And, and many of the things we're we're already working on will be available for uh, music creators as well. And and you can think about the the obvious spaces for a music creator. What they want help with is maybe slightly different things than the talk audio creators. Now we've just gone through a pandemic, so. So live events haven't, you know, physical live events haven't been the big thing, but that is a very, very big part of 
many music creators uh, revenue source also probably um, non-physical live events we'll, we'll see what happens after covid how much of that remains versus not but we we have to look at uh, slightly diff we have to look at the situation for music creator what their biggest revenue streams are and try to find products there so we are already trying to help with for example getting uh, people to your concerts because we have very good information about who is likely to go to, to your concerts based on their listening where they live where you're touring so we have tried to build these instruments uh, for creators already we're working right. on on uh, uh, tipping features and and art to support and so forth so we've we've started working on it but uh, without saying too much we are not at the end of the of the road on these things as you're talking about new business models my mind um, immediately starts to wander to nfts which i think is an example of one of the most exciting new business models for online creators um, that has just emerged really well gotten to popularity this year and i i think that um yeah it's hugely exciting to see nfts as um a technology that is enabling digital media to be scarce and ownable and i'm curious if you guys have any thoughts that you guys can share on how you're thinking about the applications of crypto or NFTs as it relates to creator monetization. Personally, on a, on a philosophical level, I'm also very excited about NFTs. I'm, I'm sure it's going to go kind of boom bust, but then come back is, is my mm-hmm. bet that it's going to actually work. It's just going to be, it's just going to go through one of these cycles. But, but I definitely think that there's a big chance that there is something there. I think it's exciting that the concept of creating scarcity and, and traceability on online. And so um, if I try to talk a little bit about both NFTs and then blockchain in, in general, we, we've looked at it and um, uh, we've had people uh, who have been um, working on, on these technologies. And so I think, I think it's a really exciting potential additional business model to be able to work with scarcity that's that's like you know right. the internet is about abundance right. and so we've had business models based on, about, uh, on abundance now this is a potential i would say it's, it's just very early who knows but we think it's super interesting that there is a potential to work with scarcity as a business model as well in in the in the digital world so um i can't say anything concrete about it um what what, what we would do or not but i think it's a very interesting uh, new, I, I think of it as a new business model to the internet. Now, you can think of it, of blockchains in general, as a, as solving a few different problems. One of the things blockchains solve that is not specific to NFTs is that it solves uh, cooperation in a no, non-trust environment. Mm-hmm. And so you've actually had things similar to NFTs in, in, in closed platforms where everyone is on the same platform and you trust them, you've had things like NFTs for a long time. You can buy scarce goods in, in Fortnite or something. It's, it's, it's kind of an NFT. It doesn't right. require a blockchain because it's in a single closed environment. So, so that idea has, has existed. And I think there's actually plenty of proof that digital scarcity works. What is interesting about NFT then is combined with a blockchain is it could work in a larger setting than just within one closed platform. So that's kind of how we think about blockchain. The opportunity of blockchain is that you could potentially cooperate in a larger setting than just within your own uh, closed system. And and I, I personally think, while that might sound strange, because you think you, know, you always want to optimize for your own closed system, I think there are many cases, especially in music, where you want to optimize globally. If you think about the music catalog in general, the whole use case is actually to put together a playlist of different songs into a playlist session that makes sense for you. So in music, we actually don't want uh, the music catalog to break up into local exclusivity. It's just bad for everyone. And I think that there are many of these situations where both in in, in music, I think in general tech, you see this in medicine, you see it between these big companies now around GDPR where no one wants to share any data, but they still want to somehow cooperate in an anonymized way because it's better for the consumer. I think you're going to see uh, the use of, of maybe things like blockchain to, to build like globally better products in a 
safe way. So I think I think there there's actually much more will from these big companies to to cooperate globally in many use cases mm -hmm. than people might think. And that's how I think about blockchain. It could be one of those things that enables that. And then, uh, as I said, NFTs, you could almost think of it as separate from blockchains. I think it's a, it's a business model that hasn't been scarcity, digital scarcity business model that hasn't been leveraged yet in music and media as much. It could be leveraged inside a single platform, but the promise of M NFT is that it could somehow also be a global object and that gives it more relevance. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. I think it's, I mean, I'm a technologist. I think it's super interesting. I can say that much. There's this framework that that Lee has that I really like where there's, you know, the thousand true fans is maybe like people who are willing to pay you like five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, whatever. That's enough to make a living on. And then there's like the hundred true fans that maybe are willing to pay you like a thousand bucks for like a course or something that's like a really big deal where there's much more exclusivity and direct connection between you and the creator. And then there's like the one true fan, which is the sort of what the NFT represents where it's like, if someone like, you know, if, if I'm a musician coming out with a single or I'm a podcast coming out with a new season and I create an NFT based on that, it's like, you know, who knows what that could go for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions in some cases, if you're, if you're people, um, like I'm curious, I'm like, it seems like that's the key basically to the creator middle class is like working your way up the demand curve and being able to effectively price discriminate where your biggest fans can can get more from you you can offer more to them and you can you can earn more money seems like the fastest path to sustainability i'm curious if for y'all when you think about enabling a million creators to make a living off of what they do if you view that also as the key that's sort of like working your way up the demand curve to the more true fans where there's more high demand yeah i think that's perfectly phrased i think about it the same way, it's price discrimination, uh, which, which sounds like a horrible thing. It's actually positive for yeah, for yeah. Creators. It actually it maximizes social surplus to have price discrimination. Exactly. That's also the essence of a bundle is price discrimination in some ways, right? Because you're you're basically saying I would pay a little bit for this and maybe a little bit less for this other thing. So if they're bundled together, I'll add two together, and I'm willing to pay that. But maybe I wouldn't have bought both separately at full market price. Exactly. So, so you're actually putting your finger also on one of the trade-offs there. I mean, music itself is a bundle, right? right? It's really a pretty good deal. You get like, I don't know, 50, 67, 80 million tracks. <laughs> like, right. you know, you can't listen to all of them, but for a fixed cost. So it's a, it's a good deal. I mean, the, the bundle theory says that bundles are magic in that they can, they can maximize for everyone. The consumer gets a better deal and the creators get get a better deal because you bundle them together than if everyone paid themselves. So one of the risks was with price discriminating and like picking out the items of the catalog and letting people pay is that you you unbundle it and it actually becomes slightly worse for everyone. Mm, yeah. You know. So so there's a there's a trade off there and I think music is special. You know, I I personally in my podcast talk about it being tough to negotiate with these big uh, labels because they they're so powerful. But there is also the benefit of only there only being like three, four that they could actually put together this bundle around music, which is a pretty great deal. So, so I think uh, that's why I say we want to be careful. Uh, I think there could be like a, a a situation that isn't necessarily better for anyone if the entire thing you know un unbundles, um, and and maybe then um, it's even harder to be the middle class actually. In, right. in that world, because all the revenue goes to to uh, you know a few uh, top players, so I think what is important is um, we're we're trying to do this thing where we we balance these two things. Bundles are great for maximizing revenue, but then you also lose out because there are going to be some people that aren't going to be prepared to pay that price. So you miss them completely, or would be prepared to pay much more. And the question is, can you have the cookie and eat it at the same time? And so I think. Uh, Maybe there's a good bundle around music and access to music, but you have other things on top. For example, I mean, concerts is a way to cross discriminate for for right. the mm -hmm. for the uh, creator, right? But why couldn't there be digital things that you could price discriminate with, as you said, like NFTs and so forth? So, I, I think about it in that way, and th this is also why we started talking about the fact that we don't think there's a one size fits all business model. For, for, as I said, we started with talk audio creators. Well, we need to allow more freedom for people to start 
building business models that are more like a business. So we're starting to, to open this up. But it is interesting to remember that the bundle is a pretty great deal. You're getting a lot of content for a low price. So we also want to make sure that we don't just you know, un- unbundle that because it's a pretty great consumer deal, we think, and a pretty great creator deal. It is really interesting. I think the current um, momentum in the creator economy broadly is this unbundling idea. We're, we're currently living through a phase in which creator new creator monetization tools and platforms are enabling creators to unbundle themselves from the broader bundle and price discriminate their fans. And that sounds great until you have to consider that we have a a limited pool of consumers in the world who have limited budgets and and limited budgets in terms of both time, but also um, money and attention and how much time they can spend consuming certain things. And so if everyone becomes unbundled from each other and the super fans are going off and subscribing and consuming their favorite things, that leaves out potentially a long tail of creators who are left with less than they had before. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, the world goes through these bundling and unbundling phases, right? And the famous quote about only two ways to make money, bundle right. and unbundle. And uh, both have problems. When you un- when you unbundle, there's this phase of, uh, of creativity and power given back to creators, which I think is exactly what's happening right now. But then after several years, that tends to ossify in a few creators mm-hmm. taking you know, all of, of all, all of wallet share discovery or so forth. And then bundles can be a great thing. But then bundles also reach the same problem often that they, they you know, cable TV is often uh, back in the 90s, at least was accused of like you know, shoving in lots of stuff and just controlling distribution. So so they both have their problems. Yeah. And I think you need to balance them. This is this is why we why I say we want to be careful about just unbundling, mm-hmm. but we want to allow these these uh, new business models on top. I think it's it's important to try to keep a balance there because bundles, even if the from, from cable TV, many people have a negative connotation to the word uh, bundle. It is also a form of distribution. It, you know, right. you as a creator can get included in a bundle and reach users at a scale that you could never do yourself. It's, you know, so it is a way for, it, it is a dis- distribution vehicle itself as well that people right. don't always think about. It's interesting to think about balancing the upside and the downside of a bundle. I think it might be a good transition to the next thing we wanted to talk about, which is the open access platform, where people can be included in the Spotify bundle, so to speak, of just stuff I see every time I open up my Spotify app because I'm about to like you know leave the office, I'm putting in my headphones, what am I going to listen to next? Spotify is the destination that's going to have you know, extremely handy, like right in front of me, I'm going to see some stuff that I'm likely to just within a few taps be, you know, either entertained by or informed by or whatever I'm looking for in that moment. So it's really powerful to be a part of that bundle, right? Um, But you can kind of unbundle the business model by using open access platform. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, I don't want to spoil it. Well, people already know it's already announced. But maybe maybe you could explain for listeners, what is open access platform? How does it balance sort of the benefits of distribution of being included with a bundle with sort of the benefits of independence and a direct relationship to your to your audience? It's the same thing we talked about. It's actually a balance. So at, at the stream on event uh, we had earlier this spring, we talked about the fact that in, in addition to, to just having free podcasts on the platform, uh, we were going to allow paid podcasts on the platform. And uh, we said that we were going to let anchor creators uh, charge for their podcasts if they wanted to, in addition to having them for free. And so um, I don't think that surprised, well, that surprised some people, but it wasn't that surprising. There has been private RSS for mm-hmm. a long time, but it hasn't worked on Spotify because we use a streaming technology. So so now you could do that. But I think people expected us to to stop at that. What we also announced then, which is this Spotify open access platform, OAP, or if you put the S in front, SOAP, mm. uh, which which <laughs> is an existing that. protocol, so it's it's uh, confusing uh, if you're a developer. Uh, but uh, the open access platform says that you don't actually have to use Anchor and and uh, pay through us and pay us a five percent fee. It's actually free until 2023, I think. But then you have to pay five percent fee. The problem with that is that if you're an existing um, business that has existing subscribers, 
what we're asking you is basically to churn out all their existing sus- subscribers, resubscribe them through Anchor so that we can take a 5% fee. That doesn't sound like a very creator-friendly option. Uh, so what we're offering is actually something else. What we're saying, like, you can use Anchor if you want to, but you should use Anchor because you want to, because you think it's a great deal. We think that 5% is, you know, 0% for the next two years, and then 5% is a really great deal. You should do this because you think it's good. The service is good. The tools make sense. And you think it's fair that we take that. But if you have taken the time to build your own subscriber business, you charge yourself, we actually allow you to use your own billing solution. And so because we're a streaming uh, solution, because we're a streaming service, we can't really use private RSS. So we found another way of doing this, which is to use uh, something called open authentication. Where So what, what we can take a con- concrete example here because he's announced that he will do this. So um, Ben Thompson of Stratechery, mm-hmm. he's famously not had his podcasts on Spotify at all uh, because he can't charge for them on Spotify. We didn't support private, private RSS. So what he is, do- is going to do is not to use Anchor and like try to resubscribe his, his audience through Anchor. He is going to ingest his content into Spotify. You can then find it, actually, even if you're not a paying subscriber. Then when you find it, it will be locked for you, but you can listen to a preview. You can see that it's there. What you do then is you authenticate on stratechery.com with your Spotify account as a paying Stratechery user, and it gets unlocked. Right. And the difference for for Ben Thompson is it's his billing solution. We take 0% fee of that. He can just enable his existing audience and in fact, if he wants to, he can take it take it away from Spotify again. He can kind of migrate his audience with him as a as a creator. Um, and this is not exclusive to us. If others want to build the same technology, he could authenticate his audience on other platforms as well. Uh, so this might seem a little bit strange or, or, or controversial in the sense that we're taking 0% revenue share there. But if you think about it, uh, we actually think of ourselves... Daniel says that we want to be the audio network and have all the audio. Well, if 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 we're going, if all the audio has to be monetized by us, then we're also saying that you know all the audio needs to be monetized by us. That doesn't really make sense. That all the entire world is going to cancel all their you know subscribers or cancel all their own advertising solutions and go through us. So if you looked at what we did when we took in the, the like the free part of the audio catalog, we actually said to creators. If you want, if you monetize yourself using DAI, dynamic ad insertion, you can keep doing that on Spotify. We're actually not going to ask for a rev share of your existing ad revenue. However, if you want to use our system, SAI, streaming ad insertion, which we think will perform better, you're welcome to do that. And then we take a revenue share. But it was the same thing. It was voluntary. We think that the value exchange was pretty fair. We get your content and, and thus, actually, we get some of your engagement for no cost. And you get to monetize on our platform without paying us a rev share. We thought that was a pretty fair value exchange. So then the question is, why wouldn't that be true for paid content? If we get your content for free and we get people to spend more time on Spotify and you get to monetize without us taking a rev share, that feels like a pretty fair value exchange. And if you think about it, that's kind of how a web browser works. If you use Google Chrome, you don't have to pay Google to exist in the web browser. You can choose to pay Google. You can use their Google ads if you want to. They make a lot of money from their search page, but you don't pay to exist, right? And so you also have all the content in the world in that browser. So one way to think about Spotify then is more like an audio browser. Mm. We allow people to exist without paying us. Then we offer monetization, and we're going to try to make you want to pay because we're good. And this is how we think about the world. The The other way to think about the world is um, as a closed platform, basically taking a, uh, a, a quote-unquote app store cut, mm-hmm. which we've been pretty public about. We don't think right. that's the right model. And so we, we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is and saying that if we say that we don't believe in, in, in a closed uh, monopolistic payment situation, why, why would we do that on our own platform? I just want to interject and say, I think this is so groundbreaking. And I feel like 
open access platform is no, is not getting anywhere near the coverage and analysis that it deserves because I think yeah. it is such a game changer for creators. Like, I think this move, I think in, in the past few years, there's been a move towards building walled gardens around content and trying to lock creators so in and making it really difficult for them to um, transfer, transfer their audiences to a new platform or migrate their subscribers away from where they initially built their list. And I think this is totally the opposite of that. And it makes it easy to build your subscriber base on whatever platform you choose, but also have them benefit from the interface and distribution that Spotify has. Um, like it's, it's actually pretty remarkable that this is happening. Like I feel very much gobsmacked. And like when yeah. I read the details of this, I was like, am I getting this right? Like, why is not everyone talking about this? Like this, this is a huge game changer for creators. We think so too, <laughs> that it is a big deal. And we're, we're hoping that others will follow this. Uh, yeah. Someone has to go first, but we're hoping that others will follow this. That would create, because we're going after the, 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 the browser analogy, uh, the, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't hurt us as long as we also have the content. Uh, so that's, that's what we're hoping for. And uh, we'll, we'll see. Someone has to go first and try it. And we're working very hard on trying to... We want this version of the world to play out right. where yeah. uh, the creator doesn't have to choose with which uh, vertical uh, stack they're part of. I mean, I want to be, I wanna be super, super clear that we're still trying to go to build the best ad monetization for, for free creators that want to use it want to build the best paid monetization for pay creators, want to use it. We are we are going to try to build features which can make your content even better that you can voluntarily use. But the word, the word there is voluntarily because right. you want to, <laughs> not because you don't have a choice. That's, you know, so I, I know, you know, when we talk about uh, future formats and so forth, we are we are trying to leverage the fact that we have both sides of the equation, creation and, and consumption, and we can do things like uh, feedback loops or comments or these kinds of things. And then some people say like, well, that's not open. You can't do that everywhere. And that's true, but it is also voluntary. We think it's a, that's a good, talking about balance, like we think we should be allowed to try to innovate and build new features that people can use if they find value. Totally. It's really interesting. I think it, it moves us towards this world in which... Um, creators and users are there by force essentially because they can't go elsewhere and and they can't port their content elsewhere to a world with much softer network effects where they're there because they elected to do so because the product experience is much better because that's where you know most creators have elected to put their content and i think that's just a healthier ecosystem overall for audiences, users, and platforms. The most natural fit probably of like another platform to do something like this in my mind is like maybe YouTube. I could see Twitter doing it with their increased focus on creators. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they bought review. So they're going to have like, seems like sort of native to Twitter, longer form content than just tweets, you know? So it'll be interesting to, it'll be interesting to see like what else, who, who else does this? I, it'll be also interesting to see who adopts it. Like, yeah. I kind of love the fact that the New York Times has bought Serial. They've bought a bunch of, you know, podcasting companies. They're a subscription business. That would be a huge announcement to see the New York Times is doing, uh, you know, behind the paywall podcast content because they're so focused on podcasting. I think uh, it would be really interesting to see what podcast platform supported or membership platform supported. Like, I could imagine we hear Substack announcing something, Patreon announcing something, pretty soon that they they allow for their creators to to do it. It'll just be really interesting to see how it plays out because it was literally like just announced. And I guess the only person I've I've heard saying he'll do it is Ben Thompson um, because he like wrote about it basically like at launch. Um, and um, but I would imagine over the next couple months, it'll be really interesting to see kind of like the early waves of adoption. To me, the yeah, part that's a little bit of a bummer is what you alluded to earlier, which is there's this big limiter which is Apple. So if I run into a paywalled podcast in the Spotify app, I'm guessing you can't click a button, open up a web browser, pay or authenticate with my existing paid account. And then I think I probably have to come to it from the web browser, from the creator. Like if I'm a, if I'm a Ben Thompson 
you know, potential customer, I have to like go to stratechery.com and then hit the authenticate with Spotify button rather than I'm in the Spotify app and I can hit the like authenticate with stratechery button kind of a thing. I'm guessing it doesn't go in that direction. I don't know how, how will it work. Yeah. I mean, for, we, we certainly have to follow the app store rules yeah. like everyone else. And, and so we are like, this is an app store rule compliant uh, solution for someone like Ben Thompson. Uh, he's quite good at getting his uh, his own audience. So for him, the biggest challenge is probably to authenticate them, right. Uh, right? And then, you know, we have plenty of people who buy our advertising on Spotify and, you know, to uh, to promote their own shows. And obviously, if you buy an ad on Spotify, you choose the landing page and it can be your own strategic landing page. So he could go and buy ads on Spotify to get more customers to his landing page, right? So it, it works as a system. But we are fully App Store compliant, right? So we're not putting up those um, uh, buy buttons in there. And and that's obviously a shame. We're, we're trying to do an open platform. We think others should be allowed to as well, but that's a different different right. discussion that, that I'm not the head of. Uh, but, but I think it's important to at least try to do what it is that we say that we want others to do and, and not, just, uh, not just talk about it. Um, so so we, we think that this is a great solution for people who already have big subscription businesses and feel like today the only choice is if I have my own subscription base, because everyone is vertical, I kind of have to build everything myself now. I have to build a vertical experience. I have to get all the users into my sort of, you know, podcast player for just this show. Then I have to build into Alexa, into Google, into PlayStations, into cars. Like I have to do all this distribution work to get my content out there. What I think is, is what, I, what I hope people would see with the open access platform is, no, you can actually use our distribution and, and we're not going to take a rev share. So you can, you can focus on the content. Um, like you, you mentioned, like New York Times, for example. And you know, today, I think every such player faces a choice where they feel they need to, to control uh, the customer experience um, because it's, you know, because of history uh, in the text space, I think they've been burnt. Uh, and but it's very, very expensive, as we know, to build a, a great audio experience across all these you know pieces of hardware and, and software and so forth. So we think of it I, again as a, as a browser. We try right. to build this great consumption experience. And so far for us, I said this in the podcast. What we've seen is that. Our notion is that the more you play, the more you pay. The more you engage with Spotify, the more likely you are to actually subscribe to our music tier. And, and if we would have other products in the future as well. So, so we think it's good for, for us as well. This is not, this is not just altruistic. Mm-hmm. We think getting people to use Spotify is ultimately good. right? right. And that um, having a great offering with lots of content is a good deal for us too. And that's important because I think if people don't understand our motivations, they may think like, well, is this, is this a marketing trick? Are they going to like <laughs> switch on the 30% in a year? Or like, what, what are they going to do, right? Right. But, but it is important to keep in mind that uh, we've done this for free podcasts all along. You've always been able to monetize yourself using DAI if you want to. And this is, so this is basically the same thing for paid podcasts, actually. We just needed to find a different way technically to do it. Yep. But this is the way for us to actually be able to fulfill the vision of having all the world's audio. I don't think there's a way to have all the world's audio if you're going to be vertical, because then that means you own all the world's audio. That right. doesn't seem reasonable. I completely agree with you. That's what I love about it is it's not just a, it's not just like a purely altruistic, let's be great to creators kind of move. It is that, but it's also really strategically beneficial for Spotify. Like the more that you peel back the layers of this, announcement, the more I I just felt like other platforms are playing checkers and Spotify is playing 3D chess. Like it's just so smart on multiple dimensions. Bravo. <laughs> we should talk about the uh, future of audio formats too, I think. Absolutely. Because this is another arena where there's a lot of activity. There's a lot more hype around this arena than the arena of like the open access platform. There's a lot more chatter around it, but it does feel really important of kind of we're we're moving into a world where I think audio was defined, at least talk audio was defined by the constraints of RSS 
And then now we're starting to see some action beyond that. There's, there's, you know, Clubhouse, obviously, kind of with this audio rooms format that, you know, now Twitter has and, and Locker Room, which, which, which y'all acquired, um, have. And so it'll be interesting to see kind of like how the format evolves. I kind of think the format is still TBD. Like Clubhouse has an interesting first take that proves there's something really compelling there, but I don't know if it's fully figured out yet. I'm curious how y'all think about the audio rooms format and just live audio generally or interactivity beyond the traditional podcast format for talk audio. Yeah, so I think if we start with the latter, there just hasn't been much interactivity at all for for right. for audio creators. Actually, not just talk audio, but even music creators. If you think about the, the feedback mm-hmm. loop for a musician, you work for, for months and months, you, you send something um, to a label, and if you're lucky, months down the line, you get a stream count. That's it. <laughs> no comments, no feedback, no yeah. high fidelity, just stream count, right? And um, I think the music industry has gotten used to that, and, and many artists even feel like, you know, you shouldn't do this interactivity. It's like, it's a it's an art it should just be from you without feedback but I, I don't think most creators think like that i think feedback is mostly a good thing and you want to work with your audience and, and spotify hasn't done as good a job as we want there but so this is not just talk audio it's also for for music we think feedback loops are missing and you don't have to look very far you just look to text video other mediums these creators they work with very tight feedback loops right right it, both in terms of how they're performing, which we've started with as a podcaster, you can see how your podcast is performing so, sort of almost in real time, how your episode is performing and where people are playing and stuff that you couldn't see before. So we're, we're just trying to take inspiration from from other creative mediums and apply them to to talk audio and music. And so I think that goes for, for time-shifted consumption as well. And there's, there's so much to do both in the metrics you want as a creator, music or talk, uh, to be able to understand how you're doing and, and where you're performing, to plan your tour or you know, just understand who your fans are. Who's listening to me? Like, where, where am I resonating? None of that really existed over yeah. RSS for technical reasons. And it didn't exist in music for technical reasons either because that data never got back to the labels and back to the artist. So we, we try to do that. And, and I think there is, st- I just want to say, I think there is still so much to do on that there there is just not a lot of high fidelity user feedback there's metrics now partially through us and others but there's not a lot of high fidelity feedback going back to creators we actually hear from your from your audience so that's something i'm interested in i want to be very careful in that space because i mean i think i think what you see today is creators go to to twitter to get feedback uh you know podcasters and and uh, musicians and because so it's clear that they want feedback, but obviously the you know I, I think I want to say I think Twitter is a fantastic platform. I love it, but but there is also a lot of creators get a lot of abuse. Right. So we want to be very careful in in just you know in you know we want to be thoughtful about feedback. We want creators to get high quality feedback and feel that this is still a safe environment because what Spotify represents is kind of a for, for good and bad, for f- for bad is not as interactive, but for good it's also it feels like a safer safer environment, right? right? So we want to be careful with that. But but I think there's a lot to do in in feedback for uh, creators uh, in a time shifted manner. But then you also asked asked about live, right? And I, one way to think about live it is just that it's um, it's just very effective feedback. You, you take the delay down from like maybe days to hours to minutes to like literally real time. And the, 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 the better you close that gap, the more effective the discussion is between these people, whether it's a fan and a creator or two creators or fans among themselves. So I, I think of, about it just as a feedback loop. And, and live has some benefits and some drawbacks. The benefit is that it's so effective. Because the delay is like milliseconds. Yeah. The the drawback is you have to be there at the same time, so you have more of a critical mass challenge, and uh, you need both the interesting in, in the current live implementations. You need both interesting people to be there at the same time. With, with interesting, I mean the people who talk, the people who are on stage, and the people who could potentially be invited on stage. Like the content creators need to be there all at the same time. 
but so does the audience. It's, yeah. it's quite a big challenge. You have to repeat that all the time. So, uh, so I think uh, the, the live format, I think it figured out some things that are really interesting. I think it has some challenges. I think what it figured out was that uh, it, it, one way to think about it is what, what happens on the in, in these live rooms is it, it's a discussion between two or more people. It's almost never one, just having a monologue. It's two or more in, in front of other people. And you could think of it sort of abstractly that that's, that's kind of what a podcast is too. Uh-huh. It's often two or more people, seldom a dialogue or a monologue, two or more people talking in front of an audience. But the audience is time shifted. And so what's what's different with these live rooms is the discussion is much more dynamic. It's often much more than two people. It's not pre-planned who the people are, so un, un, unpredictable, interesting things can happen, and there is not a clear boundary between who is the audience and who is the participator. And so that seems to produce a new kind of content. It's lower friction. The, the higher friction is you have to be there at the same time, but the lower friction is you don't have to say, well, maybe I should be a podcaster. Maybe I should... I need to commit to at least 10 episodes. I need to do weekly. I need to go and download tools. You just have an idea. It doesn't really matter if you think of yourself as the host or the guest. You can be your own guest or host. Or mm-hmm. It's just lower friction. And not surprisingly, whenever you lower the friction, it turns out that you thought you were at the end of history and everything that could happen could happen. But as soon as you lower friction, there's like huge amounts of unmet demand. Yeah, I think we've seen that in video. If you think about in the 90s, I, I'm sure TV producers thought like, now we produce all the video that will ever be. Then YouTube happened. and turns out, nope, change the format and there's much more. And then when YouTube scaled, people said, surely now there will not be more video. And then TikTok happened. And it's like, no, nope, there was more demand. Like, I think there's always demand when you, when you change friction. So that, I think, is what live represents. It proved that there are more people who want to talk. That's what it proved. Now, will it scale and be huge on its own? I don't know yet. It's hard to say, but I did. I do think it proved that the demand to talk was much bigger than people thought. It's, it's just like we saw in text, photos, and video. It's the same mistake every time. People think like, surely everyone isn't a text creator. Well, they were. And surely right. everyone isn't a photo, you know, photographer. Well, they were. And surely everyone isn't a videographer. Well, they were. So why not a podcaster? This is fascinating to me to hear how you think about it because. Like a year ago when Clubhouse first came out, I wrote a post kind of just explaining what it was because most people didn't know it was like still a closed beta. And at the end of it, I was like, if I'm Spotify, I, I want to buy this. But also the reason why I thought Spotify might not do this is because, you know, the, the DNA of the company is very much like not user generated content. You know, it's like the first phase is like there's a very standardized like BD deal with record labels where I'm sure there's like, you know, they send you some whatever Dropbox folder for, you know, there's some very advanced mechanism, but it's like, you know, it's pre-filtered by record labels. And then there's, you know, podcast is a little bit more, a little bit arm's length. It's like stuff on the open internet. There's some content moderation challenges there, but it's a little bit less. And then, you know, you bought anchor and that, so, okay, people are kind of using your technology to create podcasts. And so there's a little bit more moderation challenge, but this is like, you know, totally next level of like, I'm just imagining a world where Inside the Spotify app, there's a button that allows anyone to speak in addition to listen. It used to be output. Now it's also input for any user. Um, that's like a whole n- new level of moderation challenges. And it feels like a scary one to take on for a lot of companies. And so I would understand the like, you know, kind of like hesitation around that because we've seen, you know, what, hap- what, what happens on Twitter and what happens on, on, you know, also YouTube where there's a lot more friction to create because you have to actually like make a video and upload it or whatever. Um, yeah. And I'm, and I'm just curious, like, um, how do you, do you, do you see the future of live audio as being a little bit more kind of closer to like the historical thing where there's like sort of creators and consumers, or do you think that it's going to be more like, you know, a social network where it's just user generated content and everyone's a user and everyone's creating content? Well, I think, so you make a few great points there. And I said, I said already before that we are quite thoughtful and careful about, uh, user feedback, which which also means kind of user generation, right? It's a form right, of feedback, yeah. whether it's feedback or original creation, um, because we've seen what's what's happening. We want to, we want to be um, careful and more responsible, and we want to create something where people that is different. Um, and so, 
we are going to be quite careful. I, that, you know, that's what I can say. But, but as you as you noted, we do believe that there will be more and more creators. One question is: Will there be pros or UGCs? Is what people say. I don't think that's the right way to think of it. I, I think mm. it's a scale. So the question is: mm-hmm. Will there be vastly more creators? Yes, that we believe in. And so, when we started with podcasts, the kind of um, the the uh, the podcast that catalog that that um, that iTunes had, I think it was something like a few hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand items or something. And then Anchor came along, and after a while, it was more like two million. So it ten x because uh, the the friction to creation uh, lowered, right? And so we did invest in that. So actually, in a way, we we are in that. You know, we don't call it UGC because I think it's an arbitrary uh, divide. Like, when did you when do you stop becoming a user and become a creator? Right. Is right, that yeah. like after after fifteen listens or two hundred listens? You know, it's like tomorrow's creators are today's users. Today's creators were yesterday's users. Like they all exist on this gradient of creation. Exactly. So so we just think of them as creators, but many of them are small creators, right? That only have like a few listeners, or they don't create so much. So in that sense, we've been working in that area a bit longer than people may realize. Yeah. But but when you open Spotify, you don't really see that. Um, as as much unless you follow those those creators. So we we've learned a lot about this, but yes, our core belief is that there are going to be many more creators. It seems likely that it's going to to you know 10x again, mm-hmm. I think. And so we want to build tools to allow for that. But the important thing is, you should kind of learn from history. And the question is, can you make different choices and 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 do something that is better, not just more of the same. Yeah. uh, My old colleague, Sonal Chokshi from the A16Z podcast, um, she she had this really great framing of how user motivations are different on a platform like Clubhouse versus for podcasting. And she talks about how for podcasts, the KPI that you're trying to drive towards is like insights per minute. How densely can you deliver the insights? Versus on Clubhouse, what you're actually trying to deliver is like maximizing FOMO per minute, like how many moments where like that are happening live, are you cultivating the sense of FOMO to, to get more people into the room to consume it live? Um, I think there's another element of live social audio, which is like driving connection and that feeling of relating to another human being and feeling a sense of um, just emotional affirmation that I think is really hard to get through asynchronous audio. So I think it's really interesting how when you lower the friction and change the format a little bit, the user as well as the creator motivations are are different from what had come before. I agree completely. And I think uh, Sono has several of these fantastic insights. And, and the insights per minute I love and I've actually borrowed from her and used. And, uh, and I think the FOMO per minute is also a really clever one. I, I think one way to think about it is... Uh, just as it turned out that text wasn't one format, it was uh, tweets, blog posts, New York Times, op-eds. It turns out that videos wasn't one format. It's House of Cards, but it's also you know, YouTube lecture. It's uh, TikTok it's, or talk. It's probably the case that audio isn't one thing. Yeah. And we're seeing that now. And then just as, as you said, you can see between a traditional podcast and, and a live conversation, they are different. But maybe even within live, uh, you will see different things, and and within within podcasts, we see many different things. There's a there is the documentary format, kind of the the, the dramatized narrated format. There's the interview format between two people. There are many different for, creative formats there too, and I'm sure we'll see the same in live, where some conversations are the whole notion is that it happens right now, and you're there right now, and it has no value like the second after. Whereas you can see other things happening on these live platforms where it's great to be there live and it really helps the hosts because they can invite audience and so it can be more dynamic. But it totally makes sense to listen to half an hour later or an hour later as time-shifted content as well. So I think it will be interesting to see what different forms of content gets created rather than to think of it as like live is one thing and Mm -hmm. it can only do one thing. So one of the things that are interesting with Locker Room is when you look at true live, true real time, if you want to be the, the drawbacks of it is that it's a critical mass problem of, of creators and listeners, and you, you need to reach in real time. 
What I think is interesting with Locker Room is that they're sports focused. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that benefits the most from true real time is sports, right? And then if the problem is critical mass of, of creators and listeners, it helps if you have an external calendar called sports events that tells right. the whole world like when you should right. be there, right? It's right. like, now the game starts. We should all go there. So I thought that was a really smart potential use of live to focus on sports. And I think sports fans conversations is also like an untapped uh, potential. Everyone focuses on the sports events uh, with very expensive rights. Uh, but the fan conversation, I think, is super valuable and interesting. And it hasn't been captured so well, I think. So that's part of why I was really excited about uh, Locker Room. And so so I think there is really potential. For, and, and much of that conversation may truly only be relevant in the very moment. It's not useful, like even right. minutes after maybe, if it's a, if it's a game. But then I'm I'm sure there will be other content, and and you know may, maybe we'll find that hosts would like to record some of their traditional time shifted content sort of in front of a live studio audience and be more dynamic. But it's actually not super important to be there live. So we'll we'll see what happens with the creative form. I'm just excited that there's a new creation format. Mm -hmm. And I think it proves two things. It proves, again, that we're not at the end of history when it comes to formats. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen again and again. And that's very exciting if you're in the business. And the second thing it showed is that uh, it, it's a good bet that there are going to be more audio creators. It seems like a lot mm -hmm. of people would have said two years ago, like, I don't think everyone is like a talk creator. That's a high bar. And now I think after Clubhouse, people say like, no, I actually think everyone is potentially a talk creator, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what I think it proved. So that's a very, very exciting for us. I love that. And I think that is a great note to end on the fact that there will always be new formats that will develop and create. And as a result of that, that it's going to enfranchise and engender an entirely new class of creators who may have not created before. So that's super exciting. And I can't wait to see that. So thank you so much, Gustav, for being here with us today. Really enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure. Um, all of our audience members learned a ton. So really, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. And we hope to have you back on sometime and can't wait to keep track of what Spotify is doing in the audio space. Thank you. I'd love to. Thanks so much for having me. It was super fun. 